Hello, and welcome to another episode of Relational Spirituality, the podcast of LargerStory.com. The podcast that sees all relationships as spiritual and all spiritual formation as a new way to belong, become, and be known. Now, here are your hosts, Kep Crab and Duncan Spray, as they explore dancing with the Trinity. God's inviting us to dance. He's inviting us to dance with the Trinity. He's inviting us to dance the dance of love. He's inviting us to, to relate in a very different way than comes naturally to us. So we're all clumsy in responding to the Spirit's prompting. Hey, everybody. So welcome to Relational Spirituality Podcast by Larger Story. Uh, I'm Kept Crab, and we'll be hosting with a good friend of mine who has been in small groups with me for the last uh, couple of decades and whatnot. Um, and you may have seen him on the on the, the, the previous podcast. We've just got done wrapping up our last series on the seven questions of spiritual theology. And we're now moving into a new series, a new session, if you will, of what we're doing. And it's going to be titled Dancing with the Trinity. And so I've asked Duncan to join me for these podcasts as we also bring in additional guests and people that we want to chat with. And just what does it mean to be a part of Dancing with the Trinity? So, Duncan, as we get started today, just introduce yourself to everybody real quick. How'd you get to know Dad? Tell us what you're up to. Give us a quick synopsis here. Yeah, first, thank you, Kep, for inviting me to uh, be part of this conversation. It's a uh... It feels like it's a continuing conversation from every time that we get together for breakfast, but not just the conversations that you and I have had, but the conversations we had with your dad. Uh, I remember when he this idea of dancing with the Trinity became part of his vocabulary. Uh, I think it had always been part of his, that he understood the idea of the Trinity as a theological concept in his earliest books, this idea of encouragement and connecting and all the themes that were there were all relational concepts that really came out of a core belief that the final ontology of life is relational. The final nature of being is relational. And I think that's what drew me to your dad early on when I recognized how bad I was at relationships. (laughs) So back, this goes all the way back to college days, early 20s. I was barely, I'd been a Christian maybe four or five years when I was introduced my first book with Larry. And it was the book Encouragement that he actually wrote with, with Dan, I think, back in the day. And I remember him saying, there was a small section in there about good goals. And he says, a good goal is never dependent on anybody else, because then you're dependent upon them to be able to achieve that goal. And I remember thinking, then is knowing God a good goal? (laughs) And I think he would say that's the only good goal because you always have a willing participant on the other side who is all is who is radically dependent on uh, not dependent, but radically committed to my relationship with him working. In fact, he's more committed. Something in that it scratched an itch that I've now since realized it's an itch that doesn't end. It's a relational itch that will only be fulfilled in eternity. So I went from reading, being introduced to Larry by some of his books, to then finishing my undergrad and deciding I want to do a I want to do a master's degree, and I could think of nobody that I would rather study under. My biggest influences at the time were C.S. Lewis, Francis Schaeffer, Tolkien, a number of these literary types, and and then Larry Crabb. And I thought at the time, Larry's the only one still alive. I could go and study under him. And so that really opened up a door, that relational itch. Uh, Here's a man who is raising questions that I'm asking. I wanted to go and study under. So that probably was the impetus of my relationship. Then once I got there, he opened up the door relationally. Again, he invited me into a community that was already going on and fathered my soul in ways that my father never did. Invited you into the Crab family. <laughs> yeah, well. Been brother of, of Kenny's and mine for, for decades now, you know, you and Ange, and, and of course your kids and all that stuff. That's right. I love that story, bro. And I love hearing how the Lord works and just how your journey has just been twists and turns. And here we are today looking back and how did this all happen? 
That's Thank right. You, Lord. He says, sometimes he says, God's will is rarely known. I don't like that part of the quote, <laughs> that we rarely know God's will. But he says this, God's will for me particularly, God's will is rarely known, but then only in retrospect. So now as you and I as older, not, not old men, older <laughs> men look back, we go, oh, wait, God's fingerprints are all over our lives. Amazing to see. Yeah, it's so fun. To, it's a, it, the hindsight is always twenty twenty kind of thing. And That's right. When you look back, it's just it's interesting to see how the Lord puts you in different positions and places, and how His larger story is going to be accomplished, and how can we be part of it? Yeah. One of the reasons too, Dunk, that I wanted to start today with you, just the two of us, is because in the last couple of weeks you've been through something that we yeah. talked about last week at, at our breakfast, and even in our small group, you lost your mother. A yeah. few weeks that's right. And you've lost your father now 20 years before that. 30 years, yeah. 30 years before that, excuse yeah. me. And now you've lost your mom. Yeah. And I just, we wanted to title this episode today uh, of what dad would always could, could call, how do you move through That's right. hard times? Through those, as opposed to around those. So it's moving right. through, not around. And I think the thing that I would want to start with is you were unpacking some of the stuff that you went through this last few weeks in being with your mom as she was passing and just all that's involved with that. You said two words that kind of defined the the, the whole time together. And it was hard. Mm -hmm. There were some examples that were unbelievably challenging that by the grace of God, you were able to do. And then secondly, you said, holy. Mm -hmm. So hard and holy were the two words that you used to define how these last few weeks of watching your mom cross over, move through, like Daryl Johnson says, I'm passing through. And that's what we're doing. So your mom has yeah. passed through. Talk about, unpack a little bit of that hard and holy. I love the fact you just raised up the Daryl Johnson statement, because that's reframed some of the ways that I'm looking at things. And it, it goes back to, it goes back to Larry's, when he was wrestling with the death of his brother, when he was wrestling with that, he always wrestled in the form of a book. Finding God came out of his wrestling match with God over the death of his brother. And the one thing that Larry said, the subtitle of that is moving through, not around, and moving through life to find God in the middle of it. And that's Daryl Johnson. It says the same thing at my funeral. Don't say I passed away. I passed through, and he talks about passing through this thin veil. Maybe we can talk a little bit about that in a minute. But for me, the reframing that goes on in the middle of death is, um, I notice we live in a culture that hides death. We hide dying. We hide the uncomfortableness of it. We put our elderly in homes where we don't have to see them every day to see the sick and dying. But I work in the poorest countries in the world as part of uh, the journey that I've been on over the last number of years. And in those cases, they have all their, their elderly live with them. <laughs> so this idea of with and through becomes so important. Um, so they watch the whole process with them. And I remember thinking there is no greater honor than to be with my mom when she takes her last breath here. She was there 60 years ago when I took my very first breath. And the great honor I have, it's going to choke me up. The great honor I have is to be with her for her last, which God gave me the incredible gift. I felt so selfish. My sister was had to fly out that morning. My brother was off visiting a friend and my wife and a dear friend that were, all of us were at different times taking time around mom. But the time that God chose for her to take her was during the watch that I had. And there's a, a gift in that. I was singing over her. I was singing all the, singing at the top of my lungs. I figured she, she wasn't saying much at the time. And uh, as I was singing, I was singing things like Amazing Grace and I'll Fly Away and uh, some, some nursery rhymes that she told me that she had been singing late at night in the middle of the night when she would wake up scared. She said that she was singing nursery rhymes mostly as a way to comfort her, which I just love that idea that praise, that, that a song can rise up to dispel the darkness. As I'm 
singing over her. She had not responded much. And the at one moment, she her arm just goes up. Her facial expression had not changed, but her arm went up. And then it came back down, and I instantly went over and held her hand. And as I'm whispering over her, I'm saying, Mom, if the light is coming for you, you don't have to hide from it. The light will come find you. And that was a phrase that came a few nights before when Mom had said she'd woken up in the middle of the night. And this is two or three nights before she passed. She woke up in the middle of the night panicked. She And she was saying, the light, I can't find the light. I, I need to find the light. And I just whispered to her at that moment. I got by her side and I said, don't worry, mom, the light's coming for you. The light will find you. Um, really, and that just comes straight out of scripture is that the light finds us in our darkness. And so I was whispering to mom just moments before she passed. I said, mom, if the light's coming for you, you can um, follow the light. And as if she's responding to what I just said, her eyes open, and she's looking upward. With uh, She had no teeth at this time, and so with this kind of toothless smile. And then her face goes limp, and probably within a minute, she breathed her last. And I remember just going, <laughs> what did you see? So that's the moment where you sit there and you go, this is a holy place. I, it was hard those last few days. There was a, some times when I'm there changing my mom's diaper. <laughs> I, I'd never, that's hard. It's humiliating. I, I also came across some old letters that my dad had written when he was, they were young and married and they are they would have an R rating on them because of the way he just talked about his love for my mom and their union with one another. And I thought, I kept thinking how death has a way of re, reframing the way we see people. My dad saw in all of his youthful longings and lust, this woman that God had, I mean, it's the same thing we read in Genesis. This is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. I, I can't wait. But how different it is to see my mom in her own nakedness and see the shame of that as well. It reminds me of Isaiah 40. We are like grass that withers and our beauty fades. And yet I, I take great courage in the holiness of that moment yeah. that though outwardly I am wasting away, inwardly something is renewed. And that's the part that is that becomes so holy. There is a, a new strength that takes the place over the old glamour and the old beauty. A new beauty starts to arise. And that was the holy point of seeing this gentle and quiet spirit of my mom before she passes. And then that last breath, and I was literally, I saw on her neck as the pulse stopped, I could just see it stop. Yeah. And, and that's that the thin place the Celtics have talked about is finding a thin place. And I think that's what your dad understood so well, what we are, as a small group, we were been listening to some Daryl Johnson, who we think is like soulmates with you, dad. But there is a place where they all emphasize this thin place that, um, that death be brings us a breath away from the thin place between heaven and earth. It, it reminds me, though, of a picture that dad had up in their in their foyer as you walked into their home. And one was of my daughter, yeah. Josie, who uh, at the time was she was maybe six years old and just had that creamy, perfect skin and her, her hands yeah. and her sitting there with her hands and just looking very innocent and young and youthful. And then a picture of my dad's mom, my grandma, and she was wrinkled up and she was mid 80s, close to dying and had a vacant look in her eye. Yeah. And you talk about that thin place. Yeah. And I remember dad saying, one of those is closer to life than the other one. Yeah. And so when you talk about your mom, as she's looking up almost through you to see something, and wouldn't yeah. you love to say, mom, what are you seeing? Tell yeah, me what you see, and I want to know. I'm so excited. It gives me kind of goosebumps to think about. It. But yeah. it's that, that, that place where this life is passing, but the life now begins. Yeah. That's right. Closer to life. And now life has begun eternally. Yeah, 
I don't know, man. For me, when dad passed, I don't know how this has been with you in respect to your mother, because I know you've now lost your mother and your That's father, right. like you said, 30 years ago. Yeah. But it really makes me think of eternity. Mm -hmm. yeah. It really makes you think of eternity. Well, and it, it, when we're, yeah, when we're, go for it. What do we leave when we're gone? Yeah. I mean, really, what is this all about? Yeah. We think oftentimes of heaven as this far off and far away place, but heaven's not far off. It's not far away because Jesus says, my kingdom is at hand within reach. It's a breath away. It's right there. So Jesus, oh. yeah. So it's very close. Heaven in, <laughs> I love this idea. Again, Daryl Johnson builds some of this out. It's the idea that heaven encircles us in in, in another dimension where we're there. I, I remember when my first child is born, there's this short little birth canal that takes him from this, this embryo to, to too big for his surroundings. And then there's this short journey through to light. <laughs> and I'm, I've been intrigued lately by these near-death experiences where they talk about going through a tunnel to light. And I go, it sounds vaguely familiar, like our first birth, where we're moving through this, this small opening to a world that's beyond comprehension, a, a world beyond. And I think if we could see it in those same ways, I, I remember bringing our son home for the first time, and I said, welcome home. And then I realized, wait a minute. For the last nine or 10 months, you've been here. You've been walking around in your mom, in the womb. You've been going all these places. And all of a sudden, you've already been here, but now you are seeing it for yourself. I think that's something of how near heaven is. We've been in the womb of this world. And that that's all comes straight out of Romans 8. Though it, that we join in the labor pains of all creation, what's being born? The sons and daughters of God, so that that through the labor pains of this world, for in hope—that's his phrase—in hope we wait, and that's the I think the the thing of that we're so near heaven already that heaven and earth we think of them as two distant places, but one really earth <laughs> that is. A, is a micro, it, it exists within heaven. It's not outside of it. So when a Christian dies, we don't go to a far off place. We simply pass through a very thin place, a very thin veil, uh, a, a, a small birth canal. So that, that's some of the thoughts that have been stirring in me as we as I've been wrestling again. And again, my wrestling is not just with hopes of heaven, but it's my doubts that it's all for real. You made two comments that are just right along those lines in respect to a prayer, I think, that you prayed with your brother and your yeah. sister-in-law that really expressed some of the doubts that you face, that you go through, that you work with. Yeah. And then, yeah, and then the other side of it, too, was when we were having breakfast just a few mornings ago. And so many times you hear people ask you the question, did she know the Lord? Was she saved? Was she a Christian? Was she a believer? Yeah. All the questions that you have. And of course, I, I was taken back a little bit because to me, I think that's the only question yeah. at that point. But then the, what your response was really something that gave me pause is it makes me wonder, do I really know the Lord? Yeah. Do I really have the spirit in me? And you start to... I, I don't think I doubt that, but I think there's times where I wonder, Lord, where are you? Yeah. What's really going on? I believe that I'm saved. I, yeah. I know that I'm a sinner. I know that yeah. outside of the cross, I have no access to glory yeah. from the Father. And that with the cross and with Jesus's spirit in me, I have the opportunity now to do amazing things because of him. Because you and I, like you said, when we opened up this morning, before we started recording with a prayer, we can't do anything. That's Our words right. don't mean anything. Yeah. You know? But I wanted to capture this with you just because it's so fresh with having lost your mother. Yeah. And it makes me think of my mom just celebrated recently her 80th birthday. Yeah. She's a handful of years behind your mom. And who knows if my mom will ever even die. She, but it makes me think of it because you just wonder, do, do you have regrets? Do you have things that you wish you would have done? Are there? I don't think I have any of those with my father. And that was a nice thing that dad, we knew he was going. And it was like, we're, we're on this journey with you, watching you take these last breaths. But 
Uh, I didn't get a chance to be there when he passed. I was there when his father, my grandfather passed. Actually, I was mm-hmm. the only one in the room. I, you used the word gift just a second ago, the gift mm-hmm. of being with your mother when she passed. All the people rotating. So mom didn't die alone. And yeah. was, dad was out of town, if you remember, with his father. And I said, he will not die alone. And we had yeah. a group rotating through. And it happened to be on my watch that he took that final breath and went home yeah. and passed through. And it was a gift. I know it was a gift for you. Yeah. Well, I, I would love it because it's your. It was your grandpa's story that was on my mind, that kind of fueled some of the doubt. And I wonder if you'd tell the story of when when your grandpa said, "If it's all true." Yeah, it, it was. And help, help refresh my memory a little bit on. It was not his. It was his mother. I think it was his mother. No, it's it was your grandma's father. Great. Yeah. Okay. Could it be yeah, a grand? grandpa craig mile yeah his, when he was passing okay and they were together i remember this that dad telling the story before but yeah. grandpa my grandfather larry senior as as his wife's father just passed away my grandmother's father passed away they're walking and and, and they made a comment something to the effect of he'll be in glory now yeah and my grandfather says if it's all true that's right my dad was i don't know he was young yeah. four five six years old and he remembers spinning around thinking, if it's all true, dad, what are you talking about? Just, yeah. and, and it's just it, one thing that Grandpa Crab always really appreciated was wrestling with things. Yeah. And he wrestled with scripture. He wrestled with, you talk about dad writing Finding God after his brother passed. Dad lost a son. Yeah. And I, I, that's, that's a, a, perhaps even a different kind of emotion. It is. And he recalls, I, I recall him telling the story of him going out and yelling. And just yelling at God for an hour, just, just, and then when he realized that God wasn't going to repent, mm-hmm. <laughs> he figured you, there's something in this. Yeah. And so it's just the way, that's the legacy that I come from Yeah. with, um, with my dad and my grandfather. And even on my mother's side is very, I had a grandfather on my mother's side, my granddad, granddaddy Lankford, just, there, there wasn't a person that he didn't witness to. Everybody he met, he told the gospel. And he had tracks that he was handing out to people, letting them know Jesus loves you. He's got a plan for you. And you can be part of that plan, part of the larger yeah. story. But your smaller story can be part of the larger story. I don't know. It just makes me think a lot as you lost your mom, bro. And to see yeah. you go through the emotions. And I, I, we missed you at a party that we were having for mom's 80th. And mm-hmm. uh, you were in the middle of going through all that stuff. We got a chance to see Angie and she caught us up to speed. But I don't know. It makes you think that all of our time is already there. We know at some point on the calendar, it's our last one. Yeah. It gives me a sense of urgency for some reason. I don't know. Yeah. The urgency gets spurred on as the, there's a couple thoughts in my mind. One is I only, ha- I know I only have a number of days left. And I think that's the, the thing where I wake up in the middle of the night right now. I haven't slept well since mom's passing. And I would as soon as she had passed, we helped clear out her house of 50 years. Yeah. 50 years was a lot of stuff. And my mom wasn't a hoarder, but there were still lots of things that were, there were just landmines of memories everywhere we went. And so the panic that I would keep waking up with is, oh no, I have another box to go through. I have to sort through. And what it re- made me realize is I'm going to be unpacking this story for the rest for the rest of my life and that urgency is do i know enough <laughs> have i do i know my own story enough and the panic is god i got to know this now mm. and I, I just i'm comforted by the thought of uh, don't lean on your own understanding because if you unpack it too quickly you're going to miss a lot of the treasures that are there i i love the opening scene of Forrest Gump, where he's sitting on a park bench and he opens up this suitcase that he's been carrying around, this tattered old, and it's filled with memorabilia. And the rest of the movie is him unpacking one memory, one story after another. And it's not until you get to the end of it, there's been this transformative story that's been playing out that everybody else that gets a little snippet here or there that sits down on the park bench for a moment, they get a glimpse, but they don't get the whole story. And even Forrest at the end, 
is not fully aware of the whole story that's being transpired, this love story where, where a child is born out of this relationship that looks like a scandal to everybody else. And Lewis used to say, every good story reminds me of the great story. You start to hear these echoes of eternity in our stories. And so that's what death does. It makes me perk up my ears going, okay, the line that your dad would say during in Finding God was, God, I don't know that I know you well enough to trust you right now. Yeah. So part of Finding God is, I want to know you well enough that I can know you in this, yeah. through this, not around this. I remember having a conversation, I can't remember if it was with you or somebody else, it might have been even with Kenny, but where we, we just were thinking about dad and, and kind of Revelation 4 and 5 and just where he's at and just thinking, what's he thinking now? And I, and I came up with the thought of, I bet he's saying, boy, I sure worried a whole lot about nothing yeah. on the other side. Why did I spend that time doing that? Uh, isn't that so true? And then we started talking about, boy, if he had, if we had an opportunity now to get a book that he could write that from his perspective now, yeah. what a book, what a yeah. book. And I know that. Well, you know. And that's the thing that it, it strikes me that your dad used to use a phrase that I love that I've grabbed a hold of. He says, if we could only see what the angels long to gaze upon. And it came out of one of Paul's statements that the, that the angels long to gaze upon the salvation that's being revealed to us. And that's the thing that's captivated them. They're captivated with Jesus as he's captivated with us. It makes me think of one of the things I found in the house, and I actually brought it along, was this, see if you can see it here. It's this old microscope. Yeah. This was my, this was a gift my dad gave to us kids. And it's literally, it's a cheap old little microscope that you can see. <laughs> it's metal and plastic. But it was, this was my dad's idea of what a good dad does. Let me introduce you. See, like dad with around, my dad would oh, never yeah. wear a tie, but yeah. it's a, a picture of a dad with his kids yeah. around science. That was my dad's idea of a good father. Let me show you how small and intricate the world is. And then I remember him also captivating us with space and Carl Sagan was a big influence on him. And it was the sciences. Now, I think of what that picture would look like with your dad. It would be the two kids. Yeah, I think of you and the story of you and your brother with your dad with an overhead projector trying to teach you the Bible. So what are you centering your, what it means to be a good father, what it means to be a good um, husband? What do you center around? If you were to take a picture of the promotion for your life, I love that my dad introduced me to science and philosophy. He was a literature professor. He was a fine arts professor. The arts and humanities were everything in our house. Jesus was not. In fact, he was seen as the opposite I've I since the you talk about when you smuggled a Bible into your house. That's right. I'd say yeah. Kenny and Kenny and I just laugh about smuggling. We, we could go pick one of dad's nine Bibles of every translation that he had up there and grab whatever. Right. Time. Yeah. When I was given a Bible by a friend, I remember walking in. I can't walk in with this. So I literally, it's October. And I, so I have a coat on and I put the Bible under my jacket. I smuggle it into the house and then I take it and slide it underneath my mattress where guys would put everything that they're ashamed of. <laughs> now, meanwhile, on display in my room is my beer can collection, my roach clip collection, my centerfold. I, again, it was a different home that I grew up in, but the, the shame was the Bible. And when my dad finally saw that I had a Bible, he was angry because he says, at least you could read a King James version. At least it's got good literary value. You see the value at that point where what death does is it raises stories up. And the painful part, the hard part is I can't have that conversation. I can't keep having that conversation with dad. With some of my favorite times with him was when I was really doubting my faith and I started reading his books. And he was more hopeful at that moment that he's winning his son back. 
But in the end, what I realized was I could lean on my own understanding and think that I could come up with a better plan than God did. And that's, I've had a philosophy prof who said, I believe that there's something out there, but as far as it being the Judeo-Christian God, I think I could do a better job than he did. I could create a world without pain and suffering. But those are the hard places that lead to the holy places. So anyway, I'm getting worked up here. Suffering scripture seems to be, in a lot of ways, the only way the Lord can get our attention oftentimes. Yeah. But that's, again, where it goes back to what we've talked about, where what does it mean to move through? Yeah. Through the pain, through the suffering, through this, this right. narrow road. Yeah. That this life can really be, which is what I'm coming to realize is, as like you said, we're not old men yet, but we're older. Is that what you, the way you put yeah, it? That's what I said, yeah. <laughs> thank you, Mike. Thank you for that, by the way. But I'm realizing that it just doesn't get any easier. No. And, and you realize that at the end of the journey, at the end of the narrow road, it's getting, it's hardest. It's where it's really squeezing. Yeah. And you get a chance to watch that with your mother now, who you asked yeah. her, I remember you saying, you asked her, are you afraid to die? And she says, no afraid to die but i'm afraid to suffocate in yeah. my own stuff and that yeah. could be the actual but it, itself to die no yeah um, and you got to be there and witness her with her eyes open yeah. looking at something yeah her eyes were always closed and then all yeah. of a sudden wham they opened up and yeah. a minute later she crossed over yeah and that to me is just i don't know there's something really beautiful it's hard on our end but it's holy in so many ways and it brings yeah. so much stuff up in us yeah. What does it mean to move through this life like we've moved through these challenges? Because that's I, yeah. I remember Dad making the comment when he was passing. He said, I'm I'm a little bit I'm a little bit uh anxious, I guess, or whatever, because I've never done this before. Yeah. You know, this is the first time I've ever done this. So this is gonna be a, a new one. And um it's just kind of like, but but boy, he was so confident in where he was going. Yeah. He knew that he was gonna see the face face of Jesus at that point. And then I know thinking of dad and I, I'm thinking of your mom too. I hope in, in that sense of well done, yeah. my good and my faithful servant. That's right. Oh, yeah. As you say that there's a, there's an image that comes to mind of when all four of our kids were born. So it, it makes me think through not just death, but birth, the way we come into this world. All four of our children were born through cesarean, which was a wild experience. The very first time I went through it, I'm thinking, oh, they're, my wife is awake. She's alert through this. And then they put this little curtain, this veil <laughs> that separates. And I'm looking at her. And on the other side of the veil, I can see major surgery going on the other side. And I'm trying to play a tennis match between the two, going back and forth. And I've seen parts of my wife I never thought I would ever see, the internal parts of who she is. All this for this, our children to be born. And so it's interesting, from the first child to our fourth, the first experience was, I am not looking on the other side of that curtain. There is there's a, something bloody going on that I can't handle at this moment. So I am with my wife. I might have been on the floor <laughs> around me, you know, oxygen in for me. That's right. <laughs> But it was interesting, the more I became accustomed to the surgery going on the other side, by the fourth time, I'm getting up out of my chair, going around, looking, I'm all scrubbed in. So I'm looking at, at it and I'm trying to go. And the doctor literally says, could you please go back to your wife? She needs you. Yeah. <laughs> and wow. it, it, there is this idea that I became so enamored with the process that I missed the person that was still there. As I'm welcoming in my daughter, our last child, I, I was so fixated with that that I forgot that my wife was still needing my attention. And so that's this tension that's always in this life, the already and the not yet, the veil that separates the thin place that separates the battle of this world to the joy. I've often thought this, how can, I've thought, what was the hardest day of our lives? I know we have lots of pain and struggle and everything. But I think that the probably the most painful day for us was leaving that tropical, warm environment of the womb and having to come into the stark light and coldness and realities, the relational stresses. There was something when we were born into this world that we weren't ready for. 
there were battles ahead of us. And so I've often thought that the hardest day of our life is the day we're born into this world because we're not ready for it. No, you can do nothing as a newborn. That's right. You are dependent for everything. That's right. So that's the reality. I talk about the hardest day of our life is the day we're born. But meanwhile, it is also the best day on the other side of the curtain. The best day for my wife and I, you talk about the best days of our life. Uh, I guarantee you our four kids coming into this world are at the very top of that list. Yeah, sure. So that is how can the hardest day be the most holy day? Yeah. It's because there's a thin veil that, that breaks the, the battles of this life and the, free, the freedom of the next. And that's where my doubts come in, in mind. I feel like half the time I am in the womb debating whether there's life outside of the womb. Yeah. And that's what stirs up in me. That's the prayer that I was praying with my brother and sister-in-law who they're in the journey right now. They're wrestling. Is there anything beyond this life? My dad didn't think so. His conviction was the only thing you're certain of is there's food for your food for worms. That's it. So get as much out of life as you can. And that's Bible says that. If this isn't real, eat, drink, be merry, because tomorrow we're going to die. Right. But if it's true, it changes everything. It flips the whole story upside down. Yeah. Because this life is such a, a drop in the bucket in respect That's right. to eternity. And I just love chatting with you, bro. And this yeah. is going to be a fun, a fun chance for us to just to talk with each other about different things. We're opening up to some questions from different people at different times, bring some people in. But this is going to be the segment on, on dancing with the Trinity. What does it mean to have conversations that matter as we try to join the Trinity yeah. at the party that is that Trinity? And we yeah. can be part of that party as we dance with the Trinity. So I'm looking forward to doing this series with you, my man. And thanks for joining us, folks. We'll see you next time on Relational Spirituality. Keep dancing with the Trinity. If you like what you heard today, hit the like button just below. Then come back by subscribing to our podcast channel. For more resources on relational spirituality, go to our website at largerstory.com.